Okay, I think we're ready to go. Welcome everybody to our virtual happy hour. Uh, my name is Ross Beard, I'm with Shadowsoft and we're really excited to uh, partner with Red Hat today uh, in this uh, virtual happy hour event. Um, I hope you received your gift in time. Uh, I know uh, Jamie McCarty had a big role in getting those out to you, so uh, we'll hear from her in a little bit, but um, it was a little bit of something to say thanks for joining us today. Um, we want to try and keep this as engaging as possible and um, really encourage your, your feedback along the way. Um, so we'll be sharing some questions via Mentimeter. Um, there's a link to join the the, the online discussion uh, in the chat. Um, but also if you've got questions or if you've got comments along the way, please feel free to add them to the chat uh, pane in Zoom and um, would be um, you know, really uh, welcoming the discussion. So to kick us off today, let me just, I wanna start with some introductions. Um, who's going to be uh, speaking today. Uh, James, Jimi Hendrix, can you um, introduce yourself and, and talk through um, you know, what you're, you're really excited about in today's session? Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Jimi Hendrix over here at Shadowsoft. I'm a Red Hat Solution Specialist uh, with this group. And uh, the things I, I'm really excited today to discuss with you around infrastructure modernization is um, you know, three areas of key benefits, primarily. Um, and kind of the, the you know, net efficiencies, ROI, and other operational developmental benefits that will come with infrastructure modernization. All right, uh, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, Jonathan? Hey, everybody, Jonathan uh, Edwards here. Uh, one of the account managers here at Shadowsoft. Uh, just love engaging with people and uh, you know, helping them along their journey, whether uh, they're just the beginning or uh, further down, and I'll get a little bit further than that in uh, my side area. Uh, John Daly? Yeah, hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this event. My name is John Daly, and I am a hybrid cloud and application data services specialist at Red Hat, and I support our Southeast customers. So. Recognize a few names on there today. Look forward to the discussion and uh, hope to add in where I can. Thank you. Thanks, John. Steve? Hi, everybody. Steve Gerritsen, like John Daly, a hybrid cloud sales specialist with Red Hat and our application services middleware portfolio. And I work with customers in the south central part of the United States. Welcome, everybody. Jamie? Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie McCarty. I'm the marketing manager working with our, our sales teams across North America. Um, just wanted to say thank you for coming. Uh, we were trying to find um, a unique and different way to do a virtual event and make it a little bit more fun and exciting and a little bit relaxed. So we came up with the idea of a, a virtual learning lounge. So I, we hope you enjoy your baskets and uh, your cocktails, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Ross. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, I'll, I'll open it up to the guests. Does, uh, does anyone uh, want to introduce themselves and sort of share a bit more about what they're trying to learn today and um, why, they, um, why they're here? Chris Brown, Bill, do you, do you guys want to share a few words? Or? Yeah, I think everybody's being real shy today, Ross, so I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead and go. Uh, so, hey, everybody, this is Bill Pettit. I'm with Mobius Interactive Corporation, and I'm here today just to learn a little bit. We've uh, moved to cloud over the last couple of years, and learn, uh, we're just trying to learn new ways on how we can do things better and make the next step or transition in, in our architecture and infrastructure. So this is a, a good learning opportunity for me. And, and Jamie, thanks for all the treats too. I'm about to enjoy some of those here in just a minute. Thanks, Bill. Uh, which which basket did you choose? I got the uh, the cognac basket. Wow. So. So that leads me into our our next uh, question on Menti. 
uh, if for those who are playing along with us, um, you'll see the next question come up, which is what type of basket did you receive? Um, so welcoming some of that engagement. I might actually share this on the screen as well so you guys can see what we're doing. Uh, oops. There. Can you see that, uh, the, the graph pop up and down? Yeah, we yeah. can see it. Awesome. <laughs> We're, we're trying here to make it engaging. So it looks like we've got a, a few liquor, wine, some non-alcoholic. Um, so again, reminder, those that haven't logged on yet in the chat, there's a link uh, that you can log in and, and follow along and share some of your, um, your ideas along the way. All right, so moving on. A bit about Shadowsoft. Um, for those that don't know, uh, we are uh, one of the largest Red Hat partners in the Southeast. Uh, we've been working and, and partnering with Red Hat for, for 13 years. Um, and we really help companies modernize and, and scale applications. Um, you know, we've, we've helped um, customers along the way, whether it be, you know, getting started with uh, RHEL and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux to automation platforms and now really modernizing applications with Kubernetes and, and, and platforms like OpenShift. Um, one of the reasons why companies and customers work with us is that we really partner with them to accelerate their container adoption journey. So you'll hear a few ideas today, and again, we'll welcome some questions, but no matter where you are on that journey, whether you're just looking at containerizing applications or you're building a proof of concept, moving to production or scaling and migrating multiple applications, we want to be seen as your, your, your business partner to help you along that journey. Uh, our team of, of experts are certified, they're experienced. We've got a number of engagements under our belt now. So we've got that practical experience to really bring a lot of value to the table. Uh, and customers engage with us in, in three key ways. One, advisory. So we can do some sort of over the shoulder type advisory to help you get from you know, zero to, to 100%. Uh, we can help you with implementation. So if you do um, you know, want to move forward with a platform like OpenShift, we will partner with you to ensure a successful implementation. Uh, and finally, enablement. What we see as a, as a key differentiator for us is that we want to implement, but we want to enable your team so you can use these new platforms and technologies, embrace container uh, technologies um, you know, so that you can really you know, reach your business outcomes and your business goals. Certified and experienced, uh, specifically with Red Hat, but then also a lot of these cloud providers, uh, you know, as OpenShift and as uh, these container platforms are really, um, you know, ch transforming the way uh, companies deploy managed applications. Uh, we're in a great position to advise our customers, not only with the Red Hat technology, but then also how that plays with the cloud platforms like AWS, Microsoft, and Google. On that note, I'm going to hand the mic over to Jimmy uh, to talk through, um, you know, modernizing with containers and Kubernetes. Thanks, Ross. So um, when it comes to infrastructure modernization um, and specifically how we're, you know, helping organizations to modernize what they currently have, especially in on-prem environments, um, it really centers around containers and Kubernetes. And, uh, the real key benefits that you derive from pursuing this route of infrastructure modernization uh, is standardization, uh, greater resource efficiency, as well as faster time to market and ROI maximization. Uh, you know, containers and Kubernetes help deliver uh, incredible benefits to developer and operations teams. Uh, but from a purely infrastructure point of view, they also help deliver massive benefits in terms of scaling, resource utilization, maximizing our infrastructure investments while also reducing our costs across the board. And so I, I kind of like to, to position a question here to, uh, to John and Steve as well. You know, what would you say that, you know, what some of the challenges there are facing organizations around uh, more traditional infrastructure methodologies like VMs or, or bare metal? 
Yeah, I can I can jump in there, Jimmy. So I, I'd say one of the challenges that we frequently see from our customers is that you know usually an all or nothing approach to containers isn't necessarily realistic. We recognize that organized organizations have made significant investments with um, you know with their application and the infrastructure that they you know sit on today. Um, so really, just taking a holistic approach at um, you know this general infrastructure modernization and sort of piecing it by piece. Um, so it's not an all or nothing approach to, um, you know, moving from traditional servers to VMs and then moving from VMs to containers. Um, and we've even built in functionality into OpenShift to accommodate for the workloads that are running on um, your VMs today. So um, I'd say that that's one of the frequent things that, that I, I'm hearing in my conversations day to day, um, but I'd be interested to see what Steve thinks. Yeah, it's good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Steve Garrison here. Uh, yeah, very good points, John. Yes, um, um, with OpenShift, uh, customers can now manage their virtual environment as well through one through one location and one central console, providing lots of productivity for uh, for the teams that uh, that uh, want to develop applications and uh, um, make their uh, environment certainly much more productive. Yeah, and, and so, you know, with that, I'd like to kind of jump into, um, you know, the standardization component of some of our key benefits here. Um, so with that, you know, one of the big issues that we have with more traditional uh, infrastructure architectures, such as um, leveraging VMs or even a bare metal, you know, physical system is um, there's no real standardization that's agreed upon in an industry-wide sense. Um, there's no you know, industry-wide agreed upon tooling. And uh, this can lead to significant disparations between teams uh, in terms of how they, uh, the deployment methodology, uh, you know, the tools that they're using from a monitoring standpoint, um, how things are, are orchestrated from a scaling standpoint. And that just overall leads to compatibility issues and some efficiency issues uh, across the board. Um, meanwhile, you know, standardization helps make everyone's life really easy. It's, you know, having a well-formed, structured, repeatable operational design um, pathway really means organizations no longer have to develop those disparate tooling and processes, and that helps lead to those internal efficiencies from a development and operation standpoint. Furthermore, this really reduces the complexity um, and compatibility issues associated with hardware, uh, architecture, deployment and scaling strategies, as well as integrated tooling. So Kubernetes has really become the standard when it comes to uh, helping organizations modernize their infrastructure. Um, Kubernetes platforms, especially like OpenShift, really further push this point from a, having a highly opinionated and standardized method of execution, tools, and governance that really provides that further level of uniformity. So we can see that by reducing complexity and creating more agnostic yet standardized um, approaches to application deployment, development, maintenance operations, and infrastructure flexibility, Kubernetes and containers deliver large value to organizations as well as uh, end users themselves. Another key advantage of standardization within platforms like OpenShift, for example, uh, that leverage Kubernetes is the operator framework of certified operators. So um, conceptually an operator uh, takes human operational knowledge and encodes it into software that is more easily packaged and shared with consumers. So you can think of an operator as more of an extension of the software uh, vendors engineering team um, that helps watch over your uh, you know, more modernized Kubernetes environment and uses its current state to make decisions in the millisecond range. So we're, what we're doing is we're taking a standard operational model. We're implementing a lot of automation into it, uh, a lot of governance around it that helps maintain state, that helps create uniformity, something that you may not find in more traditional um, infrastructure methodologies. So you can see here that again, that that building that bubble, building that framework here, that everybody has a well-formed understanding to operate within leads to organizational efficiencies as well as cost efficiencies. And we'll kind of move into that in the next section here regarding um, resource efficiency gains. So one of the big pains of leveraging uh, VMs is harbor management and acquisition. So, while VMs are more flexible and scalable than straight physical hardware, um, it still requires a significant capital investment in that physical hardware to run at scale, uh, even in the software component as well. So as end user demand grows, so does our physical 
hardware footprint to keep pace with that end user demand. And while VMs initially deliver more efficient use of space and resources um, than physical hardware, that's no longer the case if we view it um, and experience in real dollars as a legacy method of application delivery and infrastructure design. We're really no longer talking about web scale here. We're talking about cloud scale in terms of how we approach um, servicing our end users from a demand standpoint and also how we operate internally from a demand standpoint. Uh, so in that regard, um, we can see that VMs have a very capped, um, you know, infrascaling capability, especially when we're an on-prem. Uh, and there's a heavy OS load and cost that's associated with that too, since um, we're having to implement and install an operating system at each VM. Um, and then we talk about the, the cost of scaling out physical hardware to help with that scale from a VM standpoint. You can see that we're adding up dollars very quickly. Uh, apart from the fact that VM scaling itself, while capable, uh, is often slow uh, and cumbersome in comparison to things like container architecture and technology and Kubernetes. Um, so container architecture lends itself to massive increases in resource efficiency uh, through agnosticity. It doesn't care about the underlying infrastructure as well as decoupling itself from the operating system itself. So no longer we having to acquire multiple copies of an operating system in order to run these containers at scale. Um, but within that too, leveraging container architecture and orchestration through Kubernetes and, and you know, more specifically something like OpenShift allows organizations to utilize existing infrastructure or physical hardware uh, resources and stretch them even further. So that allows organizations to expand their capabilities from a service delivery standpoint with those existing resources uh, and at reduced costs. Uh, for example, a, a one of the capabilities that's helps with resource efficiency, apart from containers consuming significantly less resources, is um, from a demand scaling capability, uh, such as bursting. So with an open shift, you have the ability to have auto scaling uh, and bursting in terms of demand, wherein um, we can set up limits to around certain namespaces and so on uh, for certain services that would allow your organization to scale dynamically as end user demand grows and withers, uh, really helping you scale very rapidly uh, and scale in an efficient fashion from a resource standpoint. Hey, Jimmy, we, we have our next question for the audience. Do you mind if I jump in and share it? Absolutely, go ahead. All right, so what is the single biggest drawback to VM-based infrastructure? Uh, so if you're following along, you've, you've now got that qu next question in Mentibeta. And uh, here's, here's the feedback so far. It looks like cost of infrastructure is, is leading. Uh, John or Steve, do you have any thoughts on this question or, or, or what you're hearing from customers? Yeah, I think that all of these options are, are very valid, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of times we do um, have, you know, a plethora of different customers that have made, as I said, like a large VM investment, sometimes a licensing model around that investment for your hosts and your guests um, is, uh, you know, kind of gets you tied into the, the model. And I think, you know, oftentimes what we see is that those providers of that virtualization solution um, are you know trying to get into the world of containers uh, more or less just because they're finding that VMs um, essentially they, they don't offer the same benefits of containers as, as Jimmy has just reviewed so you know eloquently I'd say that um, you know some of those great benefits are just the ability to use concepts like bursting and cutover and to scale behind your applications to um, host your application in a unique way to give your developers kind of self-service productivity tooling to, you know, increase your speed to market. I think that those are really all great benefits. And I'd say like, um, you know, the single biggest drawback to VM-based infrastructure, I think the, the graph shows what a lot of our customers are typically saying with us just in terms of like the licensing model that's associated with the VMwares and the Hyper-Vs of the world, right? So, um, you know, with OpenShift, we basically are looking at your application, you know, uh, deployment and packaging strategy. And we're saying, hey, if you look at this as more of a microservice based uh, architecture, then there's a lot of efficiencies that'll be gained in terms of your resource consumption. And there's a lot of ways that you can optimize um, what you've already made an investment in um, and 
just just by using it in more unique ways um, in the application landscape. So I hope that answered your question. I'd say that um, th this graph is is pretty indicative of what we hear from our customers a lot. But I'd also be interested to see what um, our some of our customers on the line think as well. Yeah. So opening it up to the to our guests, Bill or, or anyone else, do you um, do you want to share your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think from my perspective, like John said, all of these are, are very common issues that we have in VM-based infrastructure. And right now we're in a VM-based infrastructure as well. And uh, we struggle with each one of these. One of the biggest ones is cost of infrastructure. And it can add up really fast, especially if you've got different uh, requirements around different hosts and, and the different types of resources that you need. Um, we also run a geographically dispersed service. So we have different data centers in different regions where we're essentially duplicating the VM requirements across those data centers. So it adds up quickly. And um, it's just one thing that we struggle with all the time. We're actually going through a cost reduction effort right now to try to consolidate things to get that third item down. Um, and we're, we're really looking forward to going to that next step with Kubernetes and containerization and moving to where we consolidate our infrastructure into something that's more manageable, more scalable, and more cost effective. Thanks for sharing, Bill. Kevin, great to see you on the line. Do you do you have any thoughts on, on this question? No, I think it I think it makes sense what you're presenting there. I don't I don't have any additional thoughts. Okay. And I was this is Steve Gerritsen. I was just gonna add as well. Yes, I'm we're, I'm hearing a lot about the cost of the infrastructure, as Jimmy had said, uh, when you deploy a VMware environment, it was obviously the tallest bar chart there. So Definitely echo. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right, I'm gonna get this back to you, Jimmy. Give me one sec. No problem. So there you go. I, I think that that you know that discussion there really dovetails nicely into this nice this last slide here on these uh, these three key benefits, which is the fact is we, we've all recognized that VM or bare metal scaling um, and just acquisition costs alone are extremely costly for organizations over time, especially as they grow their footprint and their service capabilities, their end users. So you know, with that, we're we're trying to we're trying to make a a great return on investment, right? We invest a lot of money in this hardware. We invest a lot of money and time into the teams that that manage and develop on this hardware, um, and that you know service our end user clients um, through our infrastructure and the applications that run on top of it. And so, a, a real key advantage here of modernizing infrastructure through container utilization and Kubernetes, and especially with uh, you know tools like OpenShift is getting this fast realized gain. So what do we mean by that? So for starters, again, you experience a more rapid return on investment on your physical hardware. Um, so from the actual machines that you bought that those VMs or even just applications running on physically itself, um, you don't wanna make further investments or you wanna limit the, the increase in further investments of that physical hardware. You wanna stretch your dollars, right? So um, those physical hardware investments are, are maximized even further by more efficient use, the increase of, of being able to run additional workloads at scale on that existing hardware. The training and tool acquisition investments um, for containers as well deliver uh, a further return on investment because of the future proofing that's associated with that, as well as the increased revenue streams due to greater service availability through scale and portability of the applications. Um, so you'll consider that previous section where we really touched on the utility costs um, being reduced by more efficient resource consumption. So again, uh, as application workloads are running on physical hardware more efficiently, that means we're not uh, having to power on as many machines to uh, maintain scale, which leads to lower you know, utility consumption at that level, um, which for some organizations, that might be a pretty important you know, factor of cost. Um, and ultimately what we're trying to say is you can do more with your existing hardware, a lot more, um, but it requires us to retool our services into containers and manage them through something like Kubernetes and preferably um, through 
orchestration platforms like OpenShift, which help unify organizations uh, across all teams to develop a more efficient standardized paradigm. Um, another key benefit here within our faster realized gains too is faster, more iterative um, development. So that means uh, applications get patched, updated and deployed more rapidly, uh, more piecemeal and significantly reducing that time to market which means you have greater agility uh, to respond to end user demand and end user requirements from an update and patching standpoint and the feedback loop for increasing features and functionality. Operations teams also no longer have to focus on multiple and often disparate moving pieces and parts, as well as targets of infrastructure availability and maintenance. Now they can really focus on pure resource availability for developers. As John was saying, they can focus um, just strictly on development and the deployment model um, that they like to choose within the container architecture into more standardized pieces of infrastructure and operations that are well known, they're unlikely to change, and therefore increasing stability. Uh, more rapid iterative development also means smaller and less costly mistakes. So at the micro level, uh, when we abstract it up into the big picture, when in, in including resource utilization costs and the trade-offs experienced with more traditional architectures in the event of new deployments or patching bugs. Um, VM and physical hardware methodologies are all, are just you know all around again costly, slow moving, um, and in, in comparison to the tools that people are leveraging today, uh, may end up leaving you behind the competition in that regard uh, from the ability to get time to market at a rapid pace. So you can see here again we're we're just taking everything we've talked about previously from the efficiencies delivered and standardization across teams inside of an organization in a well-formed model an opinionated and highly governed model, the resource efficiencies that are gained from container architecture, orchestration through Kubernetes, and especially when you have a well-formed system around a platform like OpenShift, all kind of translate into uh, these greater returns on investments on existing hardware and stretching the real dollars that you've put forward in your organization and getting you greater uh, end user access to the services that you're providing. So kind of putting that all together, we can see that again, VMs are just kind of getting left behind in the dust from a, from a methodology standpoint of organizing and architecting your infrastructure. Uh, and really aren't moving forward into the future when you consider, <coughs> excuse me, when you consider what they can do from a scale standpoint, from a cost standpoint in comparison to something like containers, which are massively scalable and more efficient. Again, reducing those costs to your organization, increasing your agility and leading to significant organizational efficiencies because of the standard practices, tools and, and processes that are included within uh, a standard orchestration set like Kubernetes and especially within a platform again, like OpenShift. So with that, I'd, I'd like to kind of ask some questions to the audience here in terms of, you know, have you, you know, where you're at, one within kind of like your journey there and, and two, you know, some of the, some of the points we brought up here in terms of the three key benefits, have you experienced any of those or do you see any spot in your organization where you would experience some of these key benefits uh, up front now? Don't be shy, y'all. It's fine. I don't bite. The, the liquor might, but I don't bite. So, so we've uh, we've got another poll on Menti uh, that, that that you can use to sort of share where you are in your journey. Um, you've got options. You're you're currently containerizing applications. You're in the proof of concept. Uh, you're in production or you're in scale. And when we mean scale, we're, you know, we're migrating multiple applications and really ramping things up. If there's uh, something that I could chime in too, and I know that, that a lot of this was focused on uh, the, you know, greater infrastructure modernization and, you know, the benefits of deploying your applications in a contain, you know, container native format, right? So when you're thinking about you know, should we use Kubernetes and what distribution of Kubernetes should we look like, should we look at? There's a couple of things that I want to maybe just mention about Red Hat OpenShift that really does kind of stand us out of, you know, above the rest. Um, I'd say first and foremost, OpenShift is standardized um, on Kubernetes since the very first release back in 2015. We basically Red Hat made the investment in Kubernetes as the new de facto standard um, back in version two in 2015. And, and this was when Docker really had a, you know, a very strong market presence. And um, this was kind of in its initial um, 
opening phase, if you will. I think where we are today, now everyone's using Kubernetes. We have Microsoft and Oracle and VMware and Mesosphere and Docker and Google that are all using Kubernetes distribution. And what I'd say is when you're looking to you know, make this entire paradigm shift from the way that you're currently hosting your applications and how you're deploying these applications, you really want somebody who's trusted in the community that's also shaping the innovation that we're seeing upstream in Kubernetes. Um, and I'd say Red Hat, you know, we are the number two organization contributor behind Google who created the project. And we have the number one individual contributor um, to Kubernetes as well. And if you think Kubernetes is the way to go, um, you really need to select a vendor who actually influences the roadmap and the success of the project upstream. Um, so, you know, what we typically ask some of our customers, maybe you're in a few cloud environments, you have some infrastructure there. Um, so it's ask you know what is AWS or what is Rancher you know really doing with the community and how are they listening to their customer base and ultimately shaping the roadmap of the project itself to the things that your company really needs and that's like a principle that I'd say Red Hat holds near and dear now I could talk um, for quite some time outside of what we have uh, budgeted for this event around some of the innovation that we've built from a service capability perspective within OpenShift. And, you know, we'd welcome that opportunity to have those conversations one off as needed. But what I will say sort of at its heart is that you're gonna be supported by the same engineers that are contributing to that community upstream. So just from a support structure alone, just given the peace of mind and um, sort of the credibility that Red Hat really has in this space, in this Kubernetes space, we now even see uh, multiple different public cloud providers that had their own distribution. Well, guess what, they just started branding and, and co-engineering different distributions of Red Hat OpenShift on their native cloud, right? So um, we're seeing our footprint grow more and more since the Red Hat um, acquisition of IBM. Um, it's actually expanded our scale far beyond where we ever even imagined it as a small company to start out. So what we try to typically provide our customers is the same sort of experience that you might get upstream in open source, where we really believe that a collaborative collection of contributors um, uh, you know, really can ultimately lead to success and innovation and modernization that you would look to bring on as your company. The same way that we engage back with our customers um, through Red Hat, through Shadowsoft, just really putting everybody's minds together to see how you can ultimately sort of achieve this new, um, like I said, paradigm shift of actually Kubernetes into the organization. So um, just something I wanted to say to fill in some space there. But um, as, as I said, you know, myself, Steve, we're always I'm happy to you know, talk with you along with the Shadowsoft team about your specific company and the roadmap that looks you know, personalized for you all as well. So thanks. Thanks, John. All right, Jonathan, I'm gonna get your screen up here. Awesome, while he's pulling that up, I guess everybody take your alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage and enjoy that for a second. I still have my non-alcoholic water here. <laughs> I still have to drive in Atlanta, so <laughs> till I get home. Awesome. And John, that was a perfect segue for this. And with the Mentimeter question there that we had, you know, where are you in your container journey? Um, you know, we've seen, you know, people, you know, fall into these four categories here whether you're, you know, first off, you know, containerizing an application, trying to figure out, um, you know, what's the best application to target first and what's the right architecture for, um, you know, that, that application for that container uh, environment. So, you know, really you start looking at building a center of excellence, kind of building off what Jimmy was saying, um, focusing on a standardization method there um, that you can build on. So really just building a strong foundation to start uh, really helps the flow go um, to the, the next step, which is that of a proof of concept. And you know you want to build a model that um, you can you can refine and enhance in a way that um, once you move it to production, it, it's not going to change that much except for maybe some operational uh, tweaks there and some optimization. Um, but really setting a strong base um, and refining um, your efforts for prime time in that production area. Um, and then, you know, the third bucket there is just production. So we're, we've created an enterprise ready uh, container environment. Um, you know, in that POC stage before, you know, you've chosen a platform such as, you know, OpenShift to manage your, your Kubernetes environment. 
but in production we're we're looking at uh, building it to a, a, a sense to where it's optimized for performance. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're, we're building it to deliver for delivery for success. So, you know, just taking that model a step further so that it's ready for scale. So um, in that final step, you see scale and what we want to target there is really just creating a repeatable process. So now that you've you've gone through the production stage, you wanna make this process repeatable. And, you know, there's different ancillary pieces that, you know, um, people seem to forget about in their container journey, whether that's the storage or, or the monitoring piece that Jimmy was uh, mentioning earlier. And, you know, obviously the ever precedented um, security aspect of it all, but really just building that out for, from a scaling standpoint I think um, you want to take that strong foundation that you've used created and just um, uh, duplicate it as many times as you can on the next application that you, you know, in that first step, you, you found an application that made sense that was ready to move toward a cloud native journey into that container process. But you want to look, you know, you might have made a list of, you know, two or three applications that might have been next. You want to start targeting those um, to repeat the same process. So it was very interesting to see where everybody was. I think uh, the majority of answer, uh, answers was around that first bucket, just still kind of identifying, you know, where do I start? Um, you know, wh what's my next step and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I guess leading to the next slide there, Ross. Um, you yeah. Know, um so, Jonathan, while we're here, we've got we've got one more question here okay. on on Menti. Um, what's the most challenging part of the container journey for your company? Um, so we've got security and governance. We've got networking. Uh, we've got logging and monitoring, scaling deployments based upon load, and uh, finally resource optimization. Um, so this will be interesting to hear the feedback given that a lot of our audience is still a little early. So maybe some of these challenges haven't come up yet. Um, it looks like security and governance is, is leading the way. Um, maybe, maybe opening this up to, to John, is, is there a challenge that you hear a lot of customers coming to you as they're looking at containers and, and, and modernizing? Um, what do you hear customers telling you? Wow, security and governance is, is, is well in front now. Actually, uh, that's something that I was gonna reference. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I'd say that one of, the, one of the most frequent answers that we probably get to this question does lie around security, but the good news is um, you know, with Red Hat's development model, you know, it all lies in open source, right? And um, wh what we often say is containers are Linux. Um, you know, really the underlying OS will be distributed across your containers when you do deploy under this new architecture. Um, and within Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we have so many things that we've built in from a security perspective um, throughout the application and the container lifecycle. Um, just a couple of things kind of off the top of my head that we usually look at is, um, you know, containers really make it easier for developers to build and promote an application as dependencies um, as a unit. Um, but they also make it easy to get the most out of your servers by enabling multi-tenant application deployments on a shared host. And really what we've built into, you know, kind of that underlying OS, what you're getting with OpenShift is Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the most widely used distribution of Linux that exists. Um, but take, take it a step further, there used to be a company called CoreOS that Red Hat actually acquired. And it is an OS that is made specifically for container-based workloads. Now within what we call RHEL Core OS for all of your containerized workloads, tons of different security features within that. Um, I'd say, you know, primarily just from the, container host multi-tenancy, um, even just the content and the registries themselves, um, you know, Red Hat has secured. I'd say, you know, from the, the build and deploy uh, of, of the containers themselves, there's a, you know, a bunch of things that we've built into that as well. Um, I, I'd say like really at its, at its true form from the OS layer, what we have is, um, you know, different Linux namespaces. We have something called SE Linux that's um, really an additional layer of secure, security to keep containers isolated from one another and from the host itself. 
Um, SE Linux really allows admins to kind of enforce mandatory access controls for every user, every application, every process and file. So um, really that's built in at the OS layer itself. And then throughout the container content using trusted sources all the way through this, you know, kind of the build process and the design. Um, there, there's a ton of features in there that have, you know, sort of taken that feedback of, you know, security risks, right? And, you know, even just in the greater open source community, that's some hesitation with even saying the term of open source. And Red Hat kind of takes those projects, right? In this scenario being Kubernetes, we really harden those projects. We add in enterprise support. We have access to unlimited we add security, we add additional service capabilities from a functional perspective. We really make it easy to consume from the enterprise. So if this is, you know, kind of a challenging part of your container ad adoption journey today, let's talk about what challenge that presents from a security perspective in this scenario. And let's make sure that you have, you know, kind of the peace of mind with, you know, everything that Red Hat's built into, you know, OpenShift in this scenario um, to you know, really accommodate kind of the OS layer all the way through the application itself. So yeah, long story, because I'm a talker myself, but you know, I'd say ultimately what we what we typically see from our customers is indicative in that graph as well. So security concerns, certainly different customers have different compliance, um, things that they have to abide by. And you know, every customer is different. So what we do again is kind of, you know, listen uh, to all of our customers, see about, you know, compliance. We just had a new compliance operator come out. So if you have like PCI compliance certification that you need to abide by them you know that, that's built into the platform in the form of an operator and jimmy started talking about some of the operator framework that really openshift is built on so it's really easy to kind of um, you know stay stay in lane if you will with some of your compliance initiatives within openshift yeah john we we see that as very important to a lot of our financial our payments clients uh and then also our healthcare clients um yeah you know, they see that as, as really important so question to those who answered uh, security and governance in, in the audience, can, can anyone share, you know, why this is a challenge for them or, you know, add a little bit more color to why they selected that answer? Bill, do you want to uh, chime in here? Is there, did, did, were you in that bucket or did you choose one of the others? You would think I would. I was getting paid for this, this whole thing, answering all the questions. But um, I don't know if everybody's microphone is broken or something. But yeah, for me, it's a couple of things. For so, for one, an answer that you did not have on the list was refactoring applications. Mm -hmm. So we have applications already that, as I mentioned earlier, we've deployed globally, and it's really taking what I would call a more monolithic uh, software architecture that we've we've moved to a cloud environment and then refactoring that to where it fits within, you know, Kubernetes and containerization. So that's one of our, our first biggest challenges is trying to get that onto our roadmap so that we can take time away from feature development that's out making us money to going back and refactoring the application so that we can save money on the back end with all of the, the great things that containerization would bring to us. And then, we're, we're really operating in a financial services space as well. We're not doing any PCI information, but we work with a lot of uh, financial services institutions because of the type of service that we provide. It has some compliance features with it. And that's one of our big concerns. We get hit with audits all year long um, from top financial services industries, and we have to maintain our different levels of compliance. So. While it hasn't become a concern for us yet, it would be one thing that we're going to have to basically go through that entire compliance journey again with our customers and with our, our auditors to make sure that everything is where it needs to be for us to, to maintain our compliance and confidence from our customer base. That's interesting to hear. And, and I liked how you said that there's a, there's a balance between, you know, working on new feature development and then also working on refactoring the applications. Can you speak a little bit more about how you try and manage and, and balance that? Yeah, I think for, for us, it's really about getting, uh, getting some of this work into the pipeline. And um, we're, a, we're a new growing company. So the, the focus has been more on getting our application out and adopted in, in the world today and, and really we focused on that. And a lot of that has been driven by the feature functionality behind the application. So, you know, things like refactoring the application to fit within 
modernization and containerization is something that's always top of mind. And I think we're, we're really looking to do it uh, probably second half of next year, but it's just a balance of trying to drive some of the revenue into the organization versus stopping, taking a break and really focusing on the, the operation of the platform and of our application. So it's a constant battle between the finance guys and the sales guys, and then the, the engineering and operations team, two different mindsets within the organization. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing. It's good to, good, good to hear that insight. Uh, anyone else want to chime in? Joe Barnes, I, I see you're, you're pretty active here on the chat. Do you, do you have any thoughts, whether you want to chat it in Zoom or, or, or come off uh, mute? Yeah, um, so it's less less of a technical point um, because the security and governance obviously is surrounded by giant administrative teams, right? There's a lot of people who have a stake in making sure everything stays secure and compliant. Um, so the primary issues that we had around containerization and security and governance, even though that wasn't my selection on the um, on the the, the survey. Uh, was that when we were trying we were trying to deploy applications with this traditional VM infrastructure, uh, you can plop a VM in a in like a almost a physical location by putting it onto a specific net network segment, and then every all the security and compliance people treat it like it's a, a bare metal machine, and they're happy with that. Um, you can put an agent on it. You can uh, put it behind a firewall and observe traffic coming in and out of that network. You know, all the normal traditional stuff you do with bare metal. But when you run a containerized workloads, you have to treat things differently. You have to run specific services or sidecars or integrate monitoring that the security teams and compliance teams can verify that your things are compliant and secure. Um, and there, it's very, it's a different world when you're going from a traditional um, SOC to like the new world of, of deployment, they don't know how to deal with that a lot of times. And so when you're trying to talk about security and governance around those things, you have to change the conversation a, like a lot. It's not just a little bit, it's, this is a completely different way of doing things. And you know we're gonna have stuff popping up on different machines at different times. And we'll, we'll, you will never really know where it is until it, it's running, you know? Um, so it's, it's a different world. And so that was one of the difficulties when we were trying to containerize workloads is that the security team would said no well you can't you can't do that we need to know where it is at all times it has to have the same ip all the time and everything has to be you know documented and the path, network path has to be on this spreadsheet somewhere you know so that was our challenge thanks for sharing yeah i'd say um just if i could chime in there and yeah we we really do appreciate all that feedback too um i'd say when you look at open shift from like an administration perspective um, I'm kind of kind of fall back on operators again so so operat operators on open shift really a platform as a service right they help streamline any administrative tasks that you have for installing and updating and reconfiguring the apps by you know really putting operating knowledge into the software itself and this was previously only accomplished by you know developers and admins um, really using combinations of scripts and automation software and they're performed outside of your OpenShift clusters or Kubernetes clusters and uh, you know often often really difficult to integrate right so operators really what they do is they implement and automate kind of day one day two activities in a piece of software running inside the cluster by integrating uh, natively with Kubernetes concepts and Kubernetes APIs so an, an example of what you could, you know, have access to on um, what's called what we call Operator Hub, and and by the way, Red Hat really did spearhead the idea of operators in the Kubernetes community. So we made it a lot easier. Really, our platform is built on operators. And we made it a lot easier for our customers to connect. With that. Um, so an example of that would be like I, I think you mentioned your monitoring, right? So monitoring comes with any OpenShift for installation by default. Um, basically, Red Hat can now increase the number of uh, components that we can monitor, which means that OpenShift administrators will never start with like a blank canvas. So OpenShift users can monitor their own infrastructure and, and even their workloads themselves, right? Um, I'd, I'd say logging is another example of this. Um, it's basically we've added in two operators all built in open source communities. And, um, you know, we have better log collection performance at the same time with, you know, less resource consumption. So we have a, also like a new log forwarding API that improves supportability and kind of ease of configuration. So what we've tried to do is take some of those concerns from like an administration perspective 
And we've tried to build that into the platform so it's easy to consume and to integrate with some tools that you have today that maybe you're comfortable with using. And also rec Red Hat's recommendations of communities that we're contributing to that we're finding um, or gaining a ton of community traction, maybe for monitoring around uh, Prometheus and um, so, some other projects out there that we kind of basically allow you to use different functionality from multiple different projects by deploying them as operators on OpenShift and it's really, really easy to do. Um, you know, I'll say here, and, and, and sorry for taking so much time talking about this, but I think that microservice based architectures, when we talk about kind of refactoring the applications, um, I, it's, it's a really good point and probably should have been an option on that. Um, you know, what's the biggest hesitation uh, question, right? So I'd say that microservice architectures really do rely on DevOps practices, on um, CI CD pipelines, on any kind of a API focused designs. Um, they should also be organized around sort of business capabilities and a part of a larger um, decentralized sort of government data management solution. I'd say that um, microservice based architectures require, you know, some of those buzzwords that I mentioned with like DevOps and CI CD, that's really like a whole cultural shift of how your company works, right? How, how your ops team works, how your sec team works, how your devs work. Um, really, it's kind of bringing all of those folks together into, again, on OpenShift, sort of a platform as a service where everybody is able to sort of automate some of their day one, day two tasks um, to, to really kind of achieve this new, um, cultural shift to that is of DevOps and microservices and pipelines and so on and so forth. Cool. Anybody have, have any thoughts on that or I can turn it back to Jonathan. Cool. Yep. John, just agree with you on that. Everything you said, especially the last part. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Bill, you're the man. I like you. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a couple of different ways to, I guess, achieve your goals in, in your container journey. And, you know, you, a lot of you guys mentioned the different areas uh, where you, you currently are in that journey. And, um, you know, some things that, you know, Shadowsoft has partnered with our customers to do that's been really successful in the past is kind of like an architecture slash uh, Kubernetes health check and the goal of, you know, that health check slash review is just to help you along your journey, whether, you know, you're right there at the beginning, checking out your first application, getting it ready for containerization, or you're, you're trying to get to production or, or start to scale that uh, environment out, you know, we've built a consistent, um, you know, workflow on how to review these applications, looking at the different infrastructure pieces and the overall strategy and um, getting you to that production or that um, desirable state of which you would wanna be at. And really, you know, we're, we're looking at our experience at, you know, different uh, customer environments across different industries and combining that experience there to um, really give our uh, expert advice and, you know, enablement around some of these uh, technologies and a platform such as like OpenShift. So, um, and in that, you know, we're, we're giving um, different documentation to really help you find and analyze what makes sense for your specific environment. And based off of your environment, you know, we're building, you know, different recommendations on next steps of, you know, key areas to, to succeed and key areas to you know, uh, find growth uh, opportunities and really just um, helping you find um, the right journey uh, for your environment. So uh, we've seen this very successful. And uh, if this is something that would make sense for you, like I said, if you're at the beginning of the journey or you're at the, uh, the 99 or one yard line in that sense, and you know, almost ready to score a touchdown in production, um, we'd love to, you know, schedule a conversation with you guys. Um, you know, you can call on myself or, you know, Jimmy or one of the guys on the call from Red Hat. And we'd love to, you know, help you on your journey and make it make sense for you. Um, and one thing I, I want to comment on is uh, you guys mentioned a lot of the security requirements and stuff like that. And, um, you know, a lot of people say DevSecOps is a thing. And I think, you know, with 
and, and looking at your container journey, this is something that happens throughout. So um, one thing in you know, these kind of reviews is we wanna help identify the areas where um, the security concerns are the most. And I think in my original slide, looking at that first center of excellence, when we you typically come into these engagements, we want to bring these teams together and uh, you know really evaluate what their concerns are and what the security requirements are. And so um, through that, we're able to you know really alleviate and de-risk some of that um, stress uh, overall when you're looking at your container journey. So uh, I'd highly encourage you know if if this is something you guys are struggling with, would love to you know jump on the phone. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm gonna take the screen back and uh, wrap things up with a few more uh, questions. Uh, give me one second here. Right, so on Mentimeter, we have um, uh, another question. What would you like to hear uh, from us next time? So, you know, we heard a lot about security today. Um, you know, we, we've got some other topics that we're planning for, where we're considering for, for next quarter. Um, and we're really focused on making sure that we're addressing your specific needs. Um, so your feedback here would be uh, really handy uh, as we think about uh, our next event. Legacy app modernization to containers, that makes sense. We heard a lot about uh, refactoring being a challenge. Okay. Um, any any final sort of thoughts here from the team? We'll, we'll open up to Q and A now, uh, and then then work through some of these additional you know sort of last survey questions. But are there any? Any um, questions that you have for Shadowsoft, for Red Hat, any questions around OpenShift that we can help clarify for you? I think for me, that was really good. Some really good information to start with and looking forward to the next session. All right, Th thanks for that feedback. Is, is anyone currently using OpenShift or has anyone sort of seriously considered OpenShift uh, to date? We've got one. got two interested no two that haven't considered quick question for for those two that haven't considered um if you're open to sort of sharing via text or or via or coming off mute is is there like sort of a, a reason for for not formally considered it and and we certainly understand the specific use cases and and um you know, requirements. It'd be interesting to hear sort of some thoughts from, from those two. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what, what Jimmy said earlier. We won't fight. So <laughs> <laughs> if you did want to share the feedback again, it's, it's just good information for us to have. Okay. Uh, there we go. So, Thanks, Chris. Um, so this is Joe Lawrence again. I um, would say that uh, when when we do uh, proof of concepts, they tend to be shadow IT proof of concepts where we have to make a business case to somebody to buy something. Uh, and typically when something involves like um, large purchases or what it involves uh, proving that a platform will do better than something else, we, we need to have a way to prove it. And uh, with the level of complexity that was involved in attempting to do our own deployments um, without any you know, purchase or buy-in from management, uh, we just determined that at the time when we were doing evaluations of container platforms that a simple Docker, Docker deployment was the way to go. Um, it's been a long time since then. So 
you know, there's always a chance to try it again. But uh, a lot of times it comes down to, to being able to do something without any support or any funding or any marketing people coming in and, and talking to anybody uh, and being able to do it effectively enough that somebody in the management tree says, you know, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, and then wants to invite someone in for additional badgering. That's interesting. Yeah, it's great feedback. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the contribution, Joe. You know, I'd say a lot of times we have customers that share similar sentiments and the design for like an evaluation or a proof of concept is to have our most talented partner in our ecosystem in Shadowsoft, along with your Red Hat account team, sort of help establish some success criteria for you, um, really give you a hands-on approach through that evaluation um, and, you know, make sure that that's something that you can actually make a justifiable case um, for, you know, kind of going down the future. So I apologize if that wasn't your experience in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me, good on my own self. But, um, you know, I'd say move, moving onward, if you were open to doing it again, I do want to let you know that we absolutely support Docker files as well. Um, we understand a ton of customers are using Docker as their existing container runtime, and that's that's great. That's um, you know certainly a credible container runtime to be using, right? And maybe you just have it deployed on Linux containers, maybe through Docker E, or I guess Mirantis is what it's called now, right? Advanced. Um, but you know, one thing I will say is just if you, if you do decide to look at OpenShift in the future, then OpenShift has full support for Docker files. Really to get it deployed, you just need to use the Docker file and point it to a Git repository and deploy it. Um, super simple to do. We can show you in a demo in about 10 seconds. I wish I had an instance right now. Um, but really what it does is it then pulls that metadata um, from the Docker file and converts it into a Kubernetes native format. So it's um, super easy to accomplish and it's you know very well documented as well. So. Hopefully, if you do decide to evaluate maybe more of an enterprise grade platform as a service around the container orchestration strategy, right, um, then that's something that we'd hope to deliver on next time for you is just to make sure that you guys have that hands on experience, um, you know, I'll be through both the Red Hat and the Shadowsoft team. And if I could add one thing to you, this is Steve Gerritsen. Uh, there's a for those that are new to OpenShift that really want to know how it works. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat called learn.openshift.com. It's a good way to get your hands on OpenShift, no charge to you. And you can actually uh, see the ease of use and uh, intuitiveness around OpenShift. I'll put that in the chat as well. We get a lot of good feedback on this from our prospective OpenShift customers. And the one thing I will say about that too, and thanks Steve for sharing that, is that that's not actually tied to a Red Hat support structure. So exactly what I had just mentioned about establishing some success criteria and you know maybe establishing a couple uh, call cadences so we can kind of go Q&A with some product experts and everything. That's what we're looking for. So if you do decide to maybe click that and, and start playing around with labs um, within OpenShift, what we would say is just to you know make sure that you let your Shadowsoft or your Red Hat counterparts know of this. So we can, you know, you know, ex accelerate you towards this adoption, but also give you kind of the attention that it deserves when, you know, potentially bringing on a, a new platform. I, I'd say that with Kubernetes, a lot of times, like the, if the word's not confusing enough in and of itself, um, the management aspect around Kubernetes is another hesitation that people have with actually looking to um, use this as an orchestration platform for containerized applications. So. We've, uh, you know, Red Hat's really taken that to heart and we've tried to design the product, product in it itself to make it fairly intuitive. Um, we have automated installs, again, developer self-service. Um, we have like IDEs in our environment along with CI, CD kind of built in out of the box um, from an operations perspective, all automated ops, right? We talked about that a little bit, but if you are looking to kind of, uh, you know, make that evaluation, I do think it's very important to just get with your shadow soft or get with your Red Hat counterparts and let them know really what you're trying to accomplish. So that's um, public facing what he just sent. It, it's a way to try out the labs on OpenShift, it's great. Um, we can also issue you as part of the Red Hat slash shadow soft account team, an equivalent evaluation that's also tied to our support structure. Um, and you know we can make sure that we size that appropriate to the environment of where you wish to deploy. Uh, which by the way, I don't think we mentioned this either. And it's one of the largest value propositions that Red Hat does have is that we're environment agnostic. So 
you want to deploy on bare metal, you want to deploy on the VMs itself. Um, if you want to actually build out a private cloud, deploy there, um, maybe even across a number of public clouds, maybe you want to bring on a hybrid strategy where you have workloads running in each. We don't really care. It's going to be the same exact product binaries, same user experience. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to manage all of your workloads across, you know, clouds and anything that you have on-prem sort of from one uh, interface. So a couple things on that, just from the evaluation POC perspective, we do, um, you know, we, we hate to hear feedback, like, you know, Joe said, but it, it's very valid feedback. Sometimes it's just not the most intuitive. And, you know, maybe there wasn't a conversation around that prior to So We want to make sure that we're dedicating the resources to give you a, you know, full evaluation that you can feel confident about. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think, um, Joe, I, I certainly hear you that sometimes it's, you know, it's a tough, a tough um, struggle to sort of get the buy in and you've got to, you know, build that momentum from the ground up. Um, so certainly hear you on that. And, um, you know, if there's anything we can do uh, along with, with John and, and his team to help you build that from the ground up, um, we'd love the opportunity to, you know, have a chat. So in, in wrapping, uh, wrapping up today's session, I, I really want to thank everyone for their uh, participation. Uh, I hope that this Mentimeter platform, you know, <laughs> kept you a little bit engaged. We're really, um, you know, thankful that you, you participated today. And, and thank you to Jamie uh, at Red Hat, along with Mike and Layla for helping to organize this event. Those uh, gift boxes uh, were certainly uh, stunning. And I think, uh, you know, really um, were, were, were quite um, amazing. So thank you for organizing that. Um, thank you to the Shadowsoft team, uh, Jimmy, uh, Jonathan, and KC for organizing. And, and thank you for John and, and Steve for, for participating here and sharing your thoughts. Um, any final uh, thoughts from anyone from Shadowsoft Red Hat or, or the guests on the line today? If you guys do decide to consider, you know, OpenShift, consider containers holistically down the road, um, I just want to put my personal seal of approval on the partner that's actually conducted this event and that's taking your feedback and, and looking for the next topic that they'd like to discuss. Um, we have a very, very large and vast partner ecosystem, and it's not every day that we see the level of attention provided by one of our premier partners. So um, just wanted to thank the Shadowsoft team back for all the coordination along with um, our marketing team and, and you know, Jamie and, and team for, you know, putting this together and I really do think that collectively through Red Hat and Shadowsoft together, um, we can start from the ground up exactly and, you know, look to accomplish what you look to accomplish on OpenShift on, on a time frame that works for you all as well. So um, just yeah, a big thank you for the event. Thanks for allowing me to participate and uh, you know, look forward to working um, with my Southeast customers that are out there um, in the future. So thanks. Thanks, John. Alrighty, well that concludes our event. We will be following up with some uh, uh, additional information via email and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event, uh, hopefully based on the feedback you provided us today. Thanks again.